pleasure to introduce Dennis Stiegemann. He's going to tell us a little bit about <coughs> mini body localization and energy filtering. Okay. Thank you. Um, the topic of this talk is about localization in systems of many particles. And I will, will explain the technique, the proof technique of energy filtering, which is very simple, very easy to understand, just a Fourier transform. Um, on the occasion of this paper, so they didn't invent this in this paper, um, it's used many times before, but um, this paper of, uh, on many body localization uses this technique, and that's why I will review this today. So we have a quantum spin system. With finitely many sides, with finitely many spins, and the result uh, found in this paper by Christoph, Werner, Braun, Scholz, and, and Isert relates to things: strong dynamical localization. Exponential clustering of eigenvectors. Exponential clustering of eigenvectors, if you write it down mathematically, makes rigorous the idea that if you have a system that uh, shows little transport, then um, in the eigenvectors there will be, in some specific states, mm -hmm. there will be little. Uh, entanglement over large distances. But this can be formulated mathematically, and I will do this in a minute. So, the picture to have in mind that we would always throw on the board when we uh, talk about strong dynamical localization is you have <coughs> this system of many particles, and you observe one part of the system. This observable is called A. And after some time evolution, the observable A somehow spreads out. So this is the observable A after time t in the Heisenberg picture evolved with the uh, Hamiltonian of, of the system. This is strong dynamical localization. And so now let's uh, let's define the, the setting in which this takes place. So we have some uh, yeah. of the white just look like this. Uh, okay. Localization, but localization is this it doesn't spread out too much. Ah. And strong dynamical localization means that um, it doesn't spread out too much and the bound is independent of t. But I will drop right this down in the note. Um, we have a little notation. Uh, let's establish the setting. So we have finitely many sides. And so on. In some set which contains n, uh, n particles. And we can measure the distance. between two subsets x and y uh, of the whole 
lattice. So think of it as, for example, gamma to the the set, and then if we have a region x here and region y, then if we have a metric on uh, on gamma way to measure distances, then we also have one um, to measure distances between sets. At each side, x, we place a D-level quantum system with Hilbert space C to the D. <coughs> and for some um, subset of the letters, we uh, take the tensor product. all here, and the uh, Hilbert space for the whole system is this Hilbert space, tensor this, tensor this, and so on. Right? And the full Hilbert space is in this notation, this space, which turns out for all uh, D-level systems. And of course the dimension of this is To do physics, we need dynamics on here, and the Hamiltonian of such a system can be written as a sum of local terms. So, for example, if you have just the nearest neighbor interaction on a chain, if this is one dimensional, then the Hamiltonian would look like this. You have if you have this notation the nearest neighbor sites, i and j, then you have a term uh, ij. Uh, maybe in this uh, very mathematical notation. Like this, right? okay. <laughs> but we can have interactions between larger, uh, larger sets. And uh, the time evolution of an observable is then uh, already written down. Um, so, don't have to remember all the letters, just know that there are local interaction terms that make up the whole Hamiltonian. And we also consider the reduced Hamiltonian of a subset X, for example, which contains only the Hamiltonian terms uh, inside X. That's it for, for notation. So uh, now we can go on and uh, write on the main notions. First, let me write down what is strong dynamical localization that I've already mentioned. Um, the way it's written down and used in the paper uh, is the, fo the following. There are constants such that if you compare the time evolution of an observable in the Heisenberg picture with the time evolution 
by one of the reduced Hamiltonians. So if you don't do only the time evolution on some subset of all sides, then this is exponentially bounded in, uh, in the expansion. And so, I'll just write this down. So this holds for every subset. Every observable in the subset. And any distance L. And the, the corresponding picture, which should make clear what this means, is the following. You have the observable A in the set X. And now you expand this region by L. If you do the time evolution of A in this set, in this larger set here, and compare it with the time evolution in the whole set gamma, then this is bounded by this L here. So if, of course, if you uh, if you expand L, then this will go to zero. What is what we expect? Because then we will have the time evolution with respect to the whole limit uh, if you take as L the size of uh, of gamma. This this kind of bound, for those people who know this, implies a Lee Robinson bound. The problem's mod is something that holds for many reasonable, physically reasonable Hamiltonians, but this implies a the problem's bound with uh, velocity zero, uh, which is a very, very strict condition. The other condition that we will use is called locally independent gaps. I don't want to focus on this too much in detail, because that wouldn't be interesting uh, here. So um, the, the most important condition is that we expect the spectrum of the Hamiltonian H to be non-degenerate. We will require this not only for H, but also for every of the local Hamiltonians. For the morph, we will, we will uh, have a constant gamma, um, which is a uniform gap across the spectrum. So if we take any, any two different eigenvalues in the spectrum, then the minimum distance between any two different eigenvalues uh, will be gamma, a uniform uh, gap across the spectrum. And in fact, we shall require this, and that's where I um, won't go into details here. We require this for all the reduced Hamiltonians in all regions. And we will also require this for gaps. Um, or more precisely, we will not only um, require that every eigenvalue appears only once, this means non-determined, but we will also require that every gap that appears in every Hamiltonian only appears once. And there are some constants that bound the minimum distance between any gaps. Uh, this is why these results are applicable to disordered systems. Disordered systems are candidates for this, because in uh, not disordered system you would often, especially when it gets large, expect uh, degeneracy. 
but in disordered systems we can hope that there is some some disturbances so that there will be some minimum distance between uh, individual eigenvalues. Now this will now be related to exponential link, exponential clustering correlations. And this means the following. Let's take some eigenstate psi k. full Hamiltonian and inspect the difference between expectation values when we take two observables at once and then separately. If psi k is a product state, then this is zero. Those are the product states. Um, if this is small, then we say that there is not so much entanglement, right? And this will be bounded by, again, some constant. And then the distance between two sets, which are precisely those sets in which the observables are located. So this is a picture. Distance of distance of x and y. So what's this small description means? And if you move, if, if you look at two different uh, regions which are far apart from each other, then this will go to zero. The operator norms are somewhere, I guess, right? Yes, sir. The operator norms of A and B to put them somewhere. Oh yeah, uh, uh, you can take uh, observables of norm one. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, in, if you don't do that, then you should have. Uh, um, yeah, let's let's do that in the paper and uh, uh, take observables with norm one, which is not problem because otherwise you could just divide the amount. It always appears in all the norms. The paper now says. And <coughs> how do they do this? Energy filtering. And they take this then as a proposed definition of many body localization. So, so as promised, I will uh, very briefly uh, give you the main idea behind the proof. I will not even sketch the proof, just uh, tell you what has to be done. So the idea is the following. Um, take an observable and you do some time evolution, but the time evolution is with respect to some function over which you integrate. 
the filter function as it's called. And so this, uh, this function is, is L1. And the important bit about the function f is its Fourier transform, um, which will always look like this in, in this context. So in the paper, they also con uh, consider other filters, but in this simple version that I'm that you hear, they all look like, like this. Um, so this is E, if you will, because the full transform is a function of energies. And it has some width alpha. And to see what the filtering with a function f, f does, um, the short answer is it diagonalizes the observable A in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, in the energy eigenbasis. Well, it doesn't diagonalize it, it partly diagonalizes it. And we can see this very easily if we just look at the matrix elements of this filtered observable in the energy eigenbasis. So these are um, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Before I wrote it as psi k, now just bucket notation k. And if you just plug it in, you get the following. And this here is, of course, Time of root. And now, if you apply the Hamiltonian here and here, so this is uh, this exponential here, So we now easily see two things. First of all, um, let me maybe abbreviate it a little bit. If you take the matrix element on the diagonal, this is the same as that of the operator A. So the diagonal doesn't change. And now one example of an energy filter is a Gaussian, then this is a Gaussian, and F itself too, of course. And then the off diagonal elements of this observable here. They will decay. So, if the energies are par far apart from each other uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum, then this will be small. So, this new matrix then has the same diagonal, and then here it becomes rather small. And the idea in the proof is uh, how to do the proof is now very simple. is the expectation value, so it's a diagonal element. And that's why, of course, 
we can just do energy filtering without changing this number. And what you can now do is, and the, the extra proof is more complicated, but the idea, main idea is that you just insert in between here an identity, and then we'll get many terms, uh, a matrix elements K and, and L, and the same here on the other side, and you can, you are then left with um, diagonal elements, which you cannot bound, and the rest <coughs> you can bound with this, if you take, for example, a, a Gaussian filter function. And in the end, you can make the filter very small, uh, very, very narrow, so that it is it's very narrow uh, around every energy eigenvalue. And uh, if you make it narrow enough, then you can absorb all the other constants uh, in this term for a fixed system size. Okay. Uh, now I'm almost at the end, but uh, let me make some final remarks. Um, so for considering what, what, what you mentioned, let me briefly mention the local constants of motion. So, um, one effect of this energy filtering is the following. We said at the beginning that the Hamiltonian is the sum of terms that are located in some part of the lattice, local Hamiltonians. Using this technique, you can rewrite the Hamiltonian with chain with modified terms, which are related to the old ones through energy filtering. This doesn't change the Hamiltonian because if you plug in the Hamiltonian in this, uh, the full Hamiltonian in this integral that I wrote above, then it's invariant. But you have, but, but some things change. First, the commutator, let me write it like this, between the full Hamiltonian and each of these terms. It's small if you make alpha small, um, and that justifies the, no, uh, the the term constant of motion, right? Or almost constant of motion. The other point is that um, while these new terms in the Hamiltonian are not strictly located at um, at their original support anymore. Uh, they spread out a little bit under this time evolution. So uh, right here we have a time evolution, and this spreads out this this term under under the energy filtering. Uh, but we assume strong dynamical localization. So we know that the time evolution doesn't make the um, h of z spread out too much. So it's fair to say that this is almost located there. This can be made precise mathematically. And this together justifies um, the attribute here of local constants of motion. We should maybe say uh, almost local, almost constants of motion. <laughs> So, 
what do we do with this? Um, what can we try out and what are we uh, trying to do right now? Uh, often people consider Gaussians, one could try it other filter functions, um, for example, exact filters, which exactly diagonalize, which is very restrictive, um, or some other function. Um, we could try not so strong dynamical localization. So we could allow um, some time dependence. At the very beginning, I said that, that the bound that, is, uh, that uh, expresses strong dynamical localization is time independent. I think I still have it here. This bound here is time independent. We could try and introduce some general time dependence and then look what, what can we allow, how far can we go. And we may have a polynomial here, t or t. To three or something. And then, of course, always the question of the thermodynamic limit. What happens if we increase the system size? Um, this, I think, results in two general tasks. Uh, the first is optimize this whole procedure in the variables gamma. Gamma is the gap in the spectrum, the filter function, and the time dependence. And do this for finite systems, and do this uh, while asking about the thermodynamic limit. And then there's the general question whether this whole procedure um, works or doesn't work in the uh, in the thermodynamic limit. So it would be nice to find examples of systems in the um, in the thermodynamic limit which maybe don't show this behavior because. These proofs are for finite systems, and one might have some intuition from the finite case for infinite systems, but that's not a proof. And we could look for examples of why this might fail in the thermodynamic limit. So this is more a mathematical task, and this is uh, about finding examples. Okay, that's it.